morning. Good morning. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here today and worship. Lord, we pray for those that are not here for whatever reason, Lord. There's so much going on around us each and every day, Lord, that we can get caught up in. But Lord, today we come to praise you and give praise unto you. Lord, we thank you, God, for your mercy. We thank you for your love. And now James brings a message, Father. We pray that the hearts will be open to receive the word. We ask all of this in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 God is good. All, all the time. time. And all the time. God is good. God is good. Amen and amen. So, uh, again, over the last few weeks, we've discussed the evidences of biblical Christians and biblical churches. We've discussed elders and we've discussed God's design for the church, the local church, and how he designed it. And today, we get to discuss the purpose and the blessing of biblical deacons. There is a purpose to deacons, and there is a blessing to deacons, and it is a beautiful thing to see. Now, last week, I reminded you that God had a purpose and a design for everything, including the local church body. And I also uh, reminded you or revealed to you that sometimes I make decisions without thinking. I told y'all a story about the pool. And so I want to share a different story. Uh, I actually already shared it in Sunday school, but they'll still laugh probably. And, and so I, I remember having a conversation with someone recently. It was about a year ago. And, and I, now granted, I had been serving at this church for two years. And I won't mention names. And I was going around uh, uh, Port St. Joe downtown. And I was just introducing myself to some people I hadn't met yet. And praying with them and talking with them. And I got to talking to this person. I said, hey, how are you doing? And they introduced themselves. And I uh, got to talking to them. And I said, well, we'd love to have you come to church. And uh, I'm a pastor at a church nearby. And they said, well, actually, I have a church that I worship at. And I said, you do? Okay, okay. I said, what church is that? How long you I ain't never seen that person in my life. <laughs> I said, really? I said, okay, all right. Well, um, you know, well, if there's ever a time you would like to come over there, but I said, how long have you been going over there? Oh, I've been going there a long time. I said, okay, okay. I said, all right, good. And I, I said, well, can I pray with you? And I said, absolutely. They said that I can pray for God. I said, here's my card. I said, if you ever need anything, give me a call. And when they looked at that card, <laughs> Have any of you ever put your foot in your mouth before? <coughs> Have you ever done that before? Sometimes we do it accidentally, and then sometimes we do it on purpose, right? And we never dreamed, dreamed that that would happen. See, that's the thing. Sometimes we know when we're doing the wrong thing, and then other times we find out. And then when we find out, what are we supposed to do? <coughs> we're to correct ourselves. Well, where do we find truth from, church? The Word of God. Has there ever been a time where you were living in a way that was <coughs> against what Scripture says, and you were, didn't realize it, but then you're reading the Bible, and you go, oh my! Have you ever done that before? <coughs> Any, none of y'all ever done that before? Come on now. Yes? I know I have. I remember a time I had a grudge. I had a grudge. You know I had a grudge? I had a grudge, and I was holding on to that grudge. And I was saying, the Lord understands what they did to me. And I came to Scripture. And I came to the cross, and I came to read the words of Jesus, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I remember looking at the scripture and looking at me and going, uh-oh, <laughs> something has to change. Well, I say that to say this. Anytime we come to the word and it disagrees with how we're living or how we're doing things, well, we're the ones that need to change. Now, we don't need to do so uh, quickly. We don't need to do so um, in, a, in a pace that is not prayer, but we do need to do so. And so I think that's important to remember. So if we don't stick to God's design that is spelled out in his word, then we will not get the results that God wants to produce in and through us in order to advance his kingdom. In other words, less disciple making, less making of disciples. Now, I don't know about you, but when I see be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, um, when I see uh, make disciples and make disciples of all the nations, when I see that, that means that he wants us to be the organism that he designed us to be so that we can produce disciples. That is the job of the church, to produce disciples. Now, there are characteristics, there are qualifications, there are things that are in there, but when it really comes down to it, producing disciples, I'm going to move my mic down just a sad, and that might help. All right? 
So one of my favorite passages in the Bible, and, and I, I know I say that every week. You know, go, man, you say that every week. I love the Bible. I'm gonna let you. How many of you love the Bible? All right. I love the Bible, and this is one of my favorite passages. I think of it very often, and I want to read it to you. It's about the story of the Bereans. Raise your hand if you've heard the story of the Bereans. You didn't know you were going to get an arm exercise today. And so here are the Bereans. Acts chapter number 17. It's in the New Testament, and I love this group of people. All right? So it says in verse 10, As soon as it was night, the brothers and sisters sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Okay, so they were preaching in one city, one town, and they were chased out, and now they've made it to the city of Berea. It says, upon arrival, they went into the synagogue, they went into the temple, they went into the area of the teaching of the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament. They went into the synagogue of the Jews. The people here were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. That's where they just left. Since they received the word with eagerness. Say eagerness. Eagerness. All right, eagerness. And examine the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And so the Bereans were people who examined the word of God. They did not take a person's word for it. Guys, you cannot take what you watch on YouTube. You cannot take what you see on Facebook. I don't care how goofy the meme is. I don't care how cool the image looks. It doesn't matter. If it goes against the word of God, we do not accept it as true. Period. Amen? And that was the attitude of the Bereans. But I love verse 12. Consequently, say consequently. We don't get to use that word enough, so I figure we use it today. Consequently, many of them believe, including a number of the prominent Greek women as well as men. Why did people believe? Because they examined the word of God. When making decisions in our Christian walks, in our Christian churches, God's word should always be what leads to those decisions always. Not tradition, not feelings, not peer pressure. God's word, plain and simple. And so I bring up the Bereans and I bring up this conversation to do something that I have not done publicly at this point. And that is to call you and I to action biblically. The Bible spells out that it is part of the main responsibility as the pastor and the elder. And so that is what God has told me I need to do this week. That, that what we need to do is we know what the Bible says about the design of elders. We know what the Bible says about deacons at, at the end of this message. We know what the, we're going to know what the Bible says about the saints at the end of the, in a couple of weeks. And so we know what the church is supposed to be. We know that we've got some correcting to do. And so now we need to line up ourselves according to the word. Not according to me, but according to the word of God. And we need to move in a direction so that we can produce more disciples. We will, I promise you, we will produce more disciples. We will reach more people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we will get rid of the staleness in our church if we line ourselves up 100% with the New Testament design of the church. I promise you that. And that is my desire for our church. And so the main question for today is this. What is the big deal? about getting the office of deacon correct in a local church body. Why did I ask that question? Um, if you ask many pastors, their encounters with deacons in Baptist churches, very few of them will have good things to say. Is it because that the deacons were wrong or the, the pastors were wrong? It's because the design was wrong. Oftentimes, when you go into a Southern Baptist church, you will have a pastor, which is either um, the preacher, and that's it, or he's the CEO. Neither of those are biblical. And, and then you'll have the deacons. And the deacons are there because, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's a common knowledge thing that the majority of pastors in prominent uh, in Protestant churches that don't send their church pastors away, like they're there until they're not there, is no more than three years. Let that sink in. That in Baptist churches and in other churches that don't uh, appoint pastors, their denominations, no more than three years. I don't see that in Scripture. We need more men that are pastors to stick through the good times, the bad times, the hard times, the confusing times. Right now, last Sunday was three years from me. I have no desire and no plans to go anywhere else. I love this church. I love this community. I love the people of this community. My family loves this community. The Lord has burdened my heart for you all. And so what often happens is 
They said the deacons are the ones that are left behind because the, the pastors won't stick through the hard times. And so what happens is the deacons are the consistent. And what happened over time was is that the deacons served in the role, whether they wanted to or not, it just kind of had to happen, as elder and deacon, decision maker and servant. And what happened is it brought a lot of confusion. You talk to any pastor and, and that's been in ministry for a period of time, and they can tell you of the time where they were serving in the church where a deacon um, was hovering, is the word I will use, um, where they are watching you like a hawk because they think it's their responsibility to point out all your faults and to tell you how you're not doing it right. Now, I'll tell you, being in this church has not been the case. What I've had is I've had deacons who have met with me consistently pray nearly every week for you all. Have we agreed upon everything? No. There are times that they were right and there were times where I was right. But what they said is, in our business meeting, as I mentioned last week, is they said, we want to do a better job of deacon. We want to know what the Bible says about being a deacon. That meant a lot to me because I don't know about you guys, but when you see someone step out of humility and do something like that, that shows a heart to be what God has called them to be. Amen? Like if any of y'all ever had that prayer, Lord, I just show me what kind of husband I need to be, what kind of man I need to be, what kind of father I need to be. And so that is why I'm preaching this message. It's because I know that God has a design for deacons, but I also know that it is a blessing to serve as a deacon, and that we are blessed to have deacons. Now, what was also mentioned in the, in the meeting was that we need more deacons, and I agree with that. We do need more deacons, and I'm going to tell you what that means, but we also need more elders, scripturally. I don't want to be a CEO, and, and I'm not a preacher. I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor. I'm an elder. I'm an overseer. Biblically, that's what I am, but I don't want to be a CEO. Because I know if I'm a CEO, I'm going to make a lot of bad decisions. So the truth I have for you today is the following. God takes his church's obedience seriously. So I want you to repeat after me. God takes his church's obedience seriously. And he blesses our obedience. Amen? Before we dive into God's word, let's pray. And then after that, we're going to look and see what the Bible says about these. Bow your hands with you. Heavenly Father, we take your word seriously. We want to be in line with your scriptures. Lord, we want to know what your Bible says. We want to understand it. And Lord, we want to know what there is to obey from it. And Lord, again, we want conviction. We want you to discipline us when we are ignoring that conviction, Father, so that we will not stray too far. We know that conviction and discipline is the, the love that you give to us, Father. It is a, a sign of your love, saying, son, don't run too far. Daughter, don't go too far. Lord, we want to come to your word and we want to find ourselves stepping right in step with your spirit as we abide in you. In Christ's name, everybody said, Amen. 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 And today, we're going to be reading from various passages from the Bible. Again, you're listening, God. Uh, I was not able to get the scriptures on the screen, but I have the references on the screen. And the first passage will be Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. And so let's see what God's word says about the office of deacons. Number one, deacons are, in fact, one of the two offices of God's design for the local church. Uh, I, I had a pastor, a friend of mine, who inherited a church that had elders but no deacons. And, and the reason was there were some problems that happened with the deacons in the past, and so they decided to go to the elder model and then never had any deacons. And he inherited that, and it was a big problem, and he led that church through the Bible into getting deacons. And so there is elder, overseer, pastor, and then there is deacons. And that's it. That's what the Bible teaches. And so Philippians 1.1 says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints. Who are the saints? Raise your hand if you know who the saints are. Raise your hand if you are the saints. We're all the saints. Raise your hand if you are the saints. If you are a believer in Christ, you are the saints, according to the word of God. It says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including, say including. And so... Yes, I'm an elder. Yes, I'm a pastor. Yes, I'm an overseer. Yes, we have deacons, but we are saints before we are those. And so including the overseers and the deacons. And so we know that uh, this week, again, we're, we're, we're talking about deacons. Next week, we're going to talk about elders' wives and deacons' wives, because there is some clear uh, clarification for that as well. 
And then we're going to talk about the saints, and then after that, we're going to have a conversation about how do we baptize and what it would look like if we were to have elders and deacons, and how we would be able to, to run more uh, uh, functionally to be able to make more disciples. Because that is my entire goal, being here, is to make disciples and equip you to do the same and make disciples so that we can change the world for the glory of God. Amen? That's it. That's my whole desire as I serve as your pastor. Number two, biblical deacons are to be Christ-centered men who strive for holiness. Say strive. If you've ever read our membership covenant, you know that we have a lot of qualifications if you're going to be a member. We have a lot of qualifications. This is what you should expect from the pastor. But in before you even see the qualifications, the word strive is there. Why? Because you will never succeed in meeting all those qualifications. But we should never stop striving to do so. We should never excuse ourselves from not striving to do so. You should never excuse me for not striving to meet the qualifications of the Bible, what an elder or overseer is. And we should not do the same when it comes to our deacons. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, verse 8 through 10, and verse 12. We'll hit 11 after that. So, deacons, likewise, should be worthy of respect. These men should be men who are worthy of respect. See, what in the world does that mean? It means that when you look at their life, you are looking at someone who resembles the character of God. That you are looking at someone who is striving to be like Jesus. That when you look at their life, this is not someone who is wishy-washy, but this is someone you look at their life and you know they are consistent. They are constant. They are worthy of respect. Not hypocritical. They shouldn't be someone who their yes is actually a no, and their no is actually a yes, and you never know what they're going to do. You never know if you can trust them. You never know if you tell them something that they're going to share it with someone else. They should not be hypocritical. They should line their lives up with the Word of God and have the Word of God be the plumb line that keeps them balanced as men. Not hypocritical. Not drinking a lot of wine. I've shared with you, I know we're in the Baptist church, but the Bible doesn't necessarily say you can't drink. But what I've always told you is, is that if you are drinking and you cannot stop yourself from drinking, you do not need to be drinking. And you say, well, where do I find victory in that? Abide in Christ. Abide in the vine. Walk in the Spirit and get some accountability. But if you are a man and you are not a drunkard, you are... If you qualify any other characters, qualify to be a deacon. I have known men who swear up and down because they drink beer that they are not qualified to be a deacon. I told them two things. I said, one, the scripture does not say so. Two, if the Lord is convicting you about that, then you need to get rid of it so you'll be qualified. You need to determine if it's your flesh, is it Satan that's convicting you, or is it the word of God? Now, my wife and I, we're not uh, uh, shy about it. We don't drink alcohol. Uh, I, uh, my joke was, I did all my illegal stuff before 21, and I don't want to go back to all that. I'm being honest with you. It brought a lot of memories. It brought a lot of hurt. It brought a lot of pain. And, and my wife and I, we said, when we met each other, we weren't drinking. And we said, nope, we're not going to be doing that. But am I going to judge someone if they're drinking? No, not at all. But we cannot have drunkenness be a part of the character of the deacon, but let me just be more specific. We cannot have and should not have drunkenness be a part of the body of Christ. Amen? And, and let me be even more specific. Uh, we should all strive to be worthy of respect. Amen? Uh, we should all strive to not be seen as hypocrites. We should know that people can trust us, that we are consistent. They may not like what we always say, but we always say the same thing because it's what the Bible says. So uh, the, the fourth thing, not greedy for money. Um, that's an important thing. Why? The Bible says that you can only have one master. You cannot serve two masters. If you serve two masters, you will love one and hate the other. If you have a greed for money, you are not going to do well in this life when it comes to being a Christian. Why? Because the enemy will continue. Have any of y'all ever seen the commercial? I don't remember what it was, but I remember there was this older gentleman, and he's got a fishing pole, and he's got a dollar bill, and he's, he's yanking it back, and the lady's trying to grab it. You know what I'm talking about? Like, if you continue to grab for the dollar bill in front of you without consulting the Lord God in front of you, then you've got some issues. I've been that person. That is something I have to constantly allow the Holy Spirit to keep me in check on because it is a world that tempts us to think that we deserve more. 
that more is better. And in the right, more is better. More of Jesus is better. Amen? Holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. He said, what in the world? The gospel of Jesus Christ. That they hold true to what the word of God says. Because what we believe in the Bible, what we understand from the Bible, it is a mystery to those outside of Christ. They cannot and are incapable of understanding it without having the Holy Spirit and a, in my opinion, uh, a brother or sister in Christ walking them through the Bible. Does it have to happen all the time? No, not, of course not. But we have an obligation and responsibility for the lost people that would consider Jesus in our lives. We need to grab a Bible, sit at their dining room table, and answer their questions through the Word of God and watch what the Word, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit will do. And so we need to hold true to the Word of God. Amen? Amen? amen. We need to hold true to the Word of God. That I expect an amen on why? Because there are a lot of churches that have backed off holding true to the Word of God, and I don't consider them churches anymore. And neither does the word of God. They must also be tested first. What does that mean? It means that these should be people that are wishy-washy. These shouldn't be people who, all right, I just gave my life to Christ. I'm ready to be a deacon. Uh, no, 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 no. You need to go through the trials and the testings of being a Christian man. Because there are some trials to being Christians, aren't there? There are some testings when it comes to being a Christian, isn't there? And, and, and part of that is our evidence and our assurance that we know Jesus is our Lord and Savior because we've been tried and tested through our walk in Christ. Amen? We don't want. We don't want anyone coming up in here drinking on the milk bottle. We want mature believers that are eating the steak, that are eating the meat, that have the Word of God shining through their lives, and they have the scars to prove it. Amen? If they prove blameless. If, 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 if. You say, why do you keep saying that word? We should not compromise on these qualifications in any way, shape, or form. There are men that are sitting in churches that should be deacons, and there are men that are deacons that are in churches that have no business being deacons according to the word of God. If they prove blameless. Blameless. Perfect? No. Righteous. Striving for Christ's likeness. Consistent. Mature in the faith. Then they can serve as deacons. Now, one of the things you don't see in there is they're not required to teach. That is a requirement of elders, overseers, pastors, but that is not a requirement of deacons. Does that mean a deacon can't teach? Of course they can teach. Uh, you had Stephen and Philip. Stephen was the very first person in the book of Acts in the early church, the very first person who was willing to die to proclaim the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ. He was murdered for it. Verse 12, deacons are to be husbands of one wife. Now, that is a verse that has tripped up many people as well. You say, what does that mean? Well, there are a few different views. You can look at it. One of the views is, is that if you're divorced, you're never going to be qualified. And so the old adage, the old joke is, well, man, I should have killed her, went to prison, come back, repent, and then I could be a deacon. Does that make sense? No. Grace is sufficient. Now, the Greek text is a one-woman man. What does that mean? That we should be faithful men of God. Deacons should be faithful men of God. They are faithful to their spouse, but before that, they are faithful to their Lord. The reason I am faithful to my wife is because of my choosing to be faithful to my Lord first. Otherwise, I probably would not be faithful to One woman man. Divorce, in my opinion, does not disqualify you. What disqualifies you is not controlling your physical desires and not being a man who is faithful to your spouse. Because if you look at it as that they have to, because this is the other extreme, you have to have a wife. But what about those who lost the spouse? What about that? What about those who never married? See what I'm saying? Grace is sufficient. This is managing their children and their own households competently. I know that if I said this out in the public streets, that I might get hit with a stone for doing so. But a man is the head of the house. Now what does that mean? It does not mean that he is a dictator. It does not mean that he is a jerk. It means that he is held accountable to God for how that home goes. 
And understand this, man. You will answer to the Lord for how you lead your home. Period. Women, understand this. You will answer to God for how you follow the leading of your husband. Period. So, let me be a little clear on this. Men need room to fail. Not to sin, <laughs> but to fail. And so just because they might be doing it a little bit differently than you want them to, let them do it. And if they get it right, great. Celebrate that with them. If they get it wrong, don't tell them you told them so. Encourage them. Men today are so afraid to fail because they're so afraid that they'll be considered a failure in your eyes, ladies. We need to be men who are given the permission to lead the home and not lead it in according to a book, not lead it in according to their, 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 their thoughts and their desires or what Oprah says or anybody else, in accordance to the Word of God. Because the truth is that when you have godly men, godly husbands, you have less men and women in prisons. You have less abortions. You have less murders, less crime. There's a reason that Satan attacks the family unit. Because all throughout history, any time the family unit has been attacked and it's worked, it's destroyed the society. Every time. What about single mothers? You need to pray for them, serve them, love them. And we need to do the same thing for fathers. Amen? Number three. <laughs> Biblical deacons are most likely men only. Now, I know some churches disagree with me on that, and I'm okay with that, actually, because there's a room for disagreement on this. There's no room for a uh, female pastor, female uh, elder, female overseer. The Bible is extremely clear on this. There's, there's a little wiggle room on this. I personally think that the majority of the evidence lies towards it being men. Does that mean that women don't have value in the church? Uh... Yeah, they have value in the church. Any of y'all ever heard of Mary? Any of y'all ever heard of the lady we're going to discuss today? Phoebe? Junia? There are many women throughout the book of Acts who never had any kind of responsibility ever given to them until they surrendered their life to Christ and the church gave them that responsibility. You have value. But Satan will tell you that because you can't do this, that God is withholding from you, or James is withholding you, or the Bible is withholding from you. No. What he's doing is he's doing what he knows is best. Is it because men are better? We've already had that conversation. Men aren't better. Women aren't better. They're created different. You say, where do you see the evidence? All right, 1 Timothy 3.11, this is where some people will say that deacons can be women. And they'll say that the word wives should have said deaconesses. I disagree. You look at the Greek, it was women or wives. Plain and simple. That's what it was. And you say, well, why would that include that but not have anything for elders' wives? That's another argument for women deacons. I'll tell you why. I personally think that verses, uh, 1 Timothy 3 and 11, it, it, it speaks to elders' wives and deacons' wives. Why repeat the same verse when you can have it right there? Likewise. Wives. Be worthy of respect, not slanderers, self-control, faithful and everything. Again, we'll talk more about what that means next week, but specifically, wives. Be worthy of respect. Strive to be consistent in your faith. Don't run on emotion. Run on the Spirit of God. In other words, don't react. Respond. Pray before you act. Let the Word of God lead and guide you. Not slanderers. Don't slander others. You don't need to be on Facebook bashing anybody who voted for Trump or voted for Biden or they, they believe the homosexual agenda or they had an abortion or this or that. Stop slandering one another. Amen? There's no room for it in the church. We are known for how we love. Now, should we stand on the truth? 100%. You won't see me move from the truth, but you won't see me with a stone stoning the ones who are walking into lies. Now, when it's within the church, we're to handle that in a different situation. When it's within the church, we're to say, show me, I'm telling you, if you ever have someone that is 
calling themselves a Christian and saying God is okay with fill in the blank, and you know the Bible says otherwise, make them prove it. Don't slander them. Just say, show me in the Bible where you got that. And if they can't, and they're not willing to recognize that the Bible says otherwise, treat them as if they're a non-believer because that's what they're behaving like. Amen? But don't slander them. There's too much slandering going on in the world. The church doesn't need to be involved in any of it. Period. And that's not just women, that's men. Self-control. Again, self-control. Respond, don't react. Don't go with your feelings. Go with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And don't go before your husband. If there are some decisions you need to make, pray with your husband about it. That's one of my things I love about my wife is that she and I have gotten so much better that we pray about decisions, small and big, often. And I am so grateful that she has self-control and that God has built that self-control in me to do so. Faithful in everything. Be faithful. You see, why is this important? Because so many... Don't give me any names. All right, turn on videos. Don't give me any names. How many of you have ever seen a pastor's wife or a deacon's wife who has been an anchor that has kept them from serving the way that God intended for them to serve? Raise your hand. I want hands. Okay. Never have you ever seen a pastor's wife who has ever burdened the church. Never have you seen a deacon's wife who has burdened the church. That has been a gossip. That has been a slanderer. There is no room, no room, not just within the church, but within its leadership. Because if the leadership is striving, if the elders are striving for Christ's likeness, their wives are striving for Christ's likeness, if the deacons are striving for Christ's likeness, their wives are striving for Christ's likeness, and there is accountability, making sure that we continue to behave in that way, what is going to happen to the rest of the saints? What's going to happen, church? They're going to strive for Christ's likeness. But when the elders, the deacons, the elders' wives, and the deacons' wives are living contrary to the scripture, no wonder the church is falling apart. Period. Not perfect, but striving for Christ's likeness. Uh, Romans 16, 1 through 2 is another reason why the people will say, What about this lady? I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church in Sincrea. So you would welcome her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever manner she may require your help. For indeed, she has been a benefactor of many and of me also. Um, again, uh, what people will say is that she was uh, being known as a servant of the church in Sincrea. She was a deacon of the church in Sincrea. Maybe. It's a maybe. But I'm not going to build one word, one verse, and say yes to women deacons. Why? Because what we're about to read in Acts 6 and what we've already read in verse 73, it said men, 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 husbands. Does that disvalue women? No. This is a woman who was a servant-hearted woman who was serving her church and serving Paul, and Paul was grateful for her. Should we take anything from her because she wasn't a deaconess? Yes or no? No. Not at all. God valued her. Paul valued her. We should value her just like we should value the women that serve in our church in all the areas that they do. Period. Number four, biblical deacons are pleasing to God and will grow bolder in their faith in Christ Jesus throughout their service. 1 Timothy 3, 13, for those who have served well as they can serve well as they can serve well as they can. That means who have strived for holiness, strived for Christ-likeness, acquired a good standing for themselves, and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Notice that they don't produce the boldness. The boldness just naturally produces inside of them the power of the Holy Spirit. When you serve men, as elders, when you serve men as deacons, when you serve men and women as saints in the body of Christ and outside of the body of Christ, and you serve faithfully, the Lord will be pleased with your worship and your service, and you will grow in boldness in your faith. When you continue, and I'm not aiming and pointing anyone out specifically, when you sit in a pew and you only attend, and you don't be obedient to what the Holy Spirit has told you to do, what the Bible has told you to do, you will answer to the Lord for that, and you won't be bold in your faith, and that is why. That was me.
when I first gave my life to Christ, my first two years. But the Holy Spirit convicted me. I, I had a brother in Christ who, who came and confronted me, and, and God blessed my obedience and forgave me. And I praise God for that. Number five, biblical deacons are called by God to use their talents to get stuff done in the local church body so elders can do what elders are called to do by God. That is to preach, teach, pray, with the saints, to make disciples, defend the truth, and hold the members of the body accountable for Christ-likeness rather than worldliness. Have any of you ever carried too many things and you dropped it? Have you go ever done it before? You, you, I, I know the groceries. So back in the day, um, you know, I would try to carry as many groceries as I could so that I didn't have to take two trips. Have you ever done that before? All right, yep. That's probably part of the back problems there. Man. I can remember times where I would have bags all throughout my arm, all throughout my arm, and in my mouth. And I was holding these things, and I'm carrying them, and I'm trying to fall down the steps, because of course we had steps. And I can remember times, oh man, I thought I was going to tumble. And there were times where I did. Why? Because I was carrying too much. Elders are only meant to carry what the Bible says they're to carry. And deacons are only meant to carry what the Bible says they're to carry. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. In those days... As the disciples were increasing in number. So they just went from 3,000 men to 5,000 men. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. The minority has increased. The majority said no. Because you say 5,000, that's amazing. Hundreds of thousands said no. And so these 5,000 men have now become part of the church, which means they brought their families with the church. And what happened was, is... <laughs> What happens? In those days, as the disciples were increasing in number, there arose a complaint. I know none of you have ever heard of a complaint in a church before, especially a Baptist church. I know it's foreign, but just work with me. It says, a complaint by their Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. And so what had happened was is the disciples, the apostles, the twelve, up to this point, they've been handling business, and they've been handling business, and now they went from 3,000 to 5,000. And now they're going, uh, uh, and now there's complaining and there's nagging. What does this sound like, church? It sounds like Exodus with Moses when his father-in-law Jethro comes and says, hey, Moses, you're doing too much. And so the Holy Spirit tells him, guys, you're doing too much. And so verse 2, the 12 summoned the whole company of the disciples. He, he, he summoned all the believers, all the saints. They said, come on, we got to have a conversation. We're having a church family business meeting. It says it would not be right for us to give up the preaching of the word of God to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom who we can appoint to this duty. So, what they go is to say, brothers and sisters, saints, we need help. And then what they say is, is we need seven men. Again, does that, does that say anything against women? you think that women didn't help in this? Of course they did. But what happened is, is God said seven men. He could have said men and women. Seven men. And he said, I want you to give me seven men. The congregation, give me seven men that fit these qualifications. Good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom whom we can appoint to this duty. Because this duty needed to be taken care of. Otherwise, they were not going to be able to preach the word and pray as God would have them do so. Because verse 4 says, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And so how are deacons appointed according to this passage? They are recommended by the congregation and they are approved of by the elders. That is what you see right here. Select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. Whom we can appoint to this duty. This proposal pleased the whole company, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a convert from Antioch. And they had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. They laid their hands on approval, saying, I commission you to do this. I pass this on to you because the women needed to be fed. There was a need, and the disciples, the apostles, could not meet that need. And they needed the deacons to do so. Six Jews and even one Greek. I love that there was a Greek deacon in the first deacons that we have in Scripture. There was a Gentile. <coughs> 
Verse 7. So the word of God spread. The disciples of Jerusalem increased greatly in number, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. You see, deacons are selected by the local church body from among its body for service to the body, and then commended and ordained by the elders. And their authority is connected to the tasks that they have been assigned at the direction of the elders. They are to be given charge over said ministry once it has been defined by the elders. The elders are to hold the deacons accountable, but again, to say, go and do it. I don't need to micromanage you. You have this talent. You have this gift. We have ordained you. We have called you to this. I trust you. And then what would happen is that the deacons would get the help amongst the saints that they needed to get the job done. Because do you think that seven men were feeding all them widows and feeding all those wives? Raise your hand. They had help. But the deacons were the help to the elders. And so what can deacons do today? They can take care of the body. Some deacons might have a heart to take care of the home now. There are men and women who are unable to come out of their home that need to be visited. What can a deacon do? What is another task that a deacon can do? And, and, and remember this. There's nowhere in Scripture, this is a tradition thing, this is not a biblical thing. There is nowhere in Scripture where the deacons are to do the same things. Ever. They have select tasks. And so, to take care of the buildings and the grounds. That's a task. That's, that needs to be taken care of. To, to help serve in the Lord's suffering. To help in baptisms. To help in, in, in the, the ministry of evangelism. To help in the ministry of discipleship, to, to, to serve at the needs of where the needs aren't being met in the local body. Deacons are very, very valuable to the local church body. Because without them, nothing gets done, and the elders drop the groceries. And what does that mean? The preaching is hindered, the praying is hindered. The equipping of the saints is hindered, the leading is hindered, and the church is hindered. Now don't take my word for it. I want you to study the scriptures. I've given you the passages. Study them for yourselves and take the Bible for what it's for. Deacons are servant leaders and elders are leaders of servants. Number six, churches that align themselves with the elders, deacons, saints model are conducting themselves correctly based on the very word of God. First Timothy 3. Verses 14 through 16. I write these things to you, hoping to come to you soon, but if I should be delayed, I have written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. And most certainly, the mystery of godliness is great. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Is that not a verse to lead us into the Lord's Supper? Jesus is returning. He is coming back. And he takes his church's obedience seriously when it comes to his design for the church. Because when it happens, more disciples are made. And so I remind you last week, the New Testament teaches us that Jesus is the head. He is the head of the church. He is the leader. He is the authority in the church. And his leadership is embodied in the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, which is expressed in the human form of elders. Deacons of obedient service gives elders the freedom to stay true to their God-given calling. What happens when the watch is put together correctly? It ticks the right way. So what should we do with this message? As men, as believers in Christ, brothers and sisters, how should we respond? As men who are already deacons, Brother Donnie, Brother Gene, Brother Fred is out of town, what should we do? Pray for, pray for your pastor. Pray for each other. And pray for the men that God is stirring and preparing to serve as elders and deacons within his body. Pray fervently for these things. As men that are not deacons, how should you handle this? Pray for your pastor. Pray for your deacons. Pray and ask God, if, would he call you to this ministry? Because there are a lot more people that are qualified to be deacons in this church than you think. There are a lot more men that are qualified to serve as elders in this church. 
you just got to be willing to do it. As women, how do we do this? We pray for the current elders. You pray for myself. You pray for the deacons. You pray for the future deacons, the future elders. And you pray for your husbands. You encourage your husbands. You, you, you build them up. You don't tear them down. You never use the word of God to tear another brother or sister in Christ down. You certainly don't use it to tear down lost people. We do it to build one another up. Your husbands are craving to be built up. Build them up. Build them up. Your marriages will be so much more fruitful. You will see the fruit of the Spirit being produced in Him in ways you haven't seen. If you'll just build them up. Men, build up your women. As the Word of God says as well. As a church, we need to pray to God for unity. As He clarifies for us through His Word what a local church is and is not to look like. So how do we respond to this message if we have any conviction in this church? How should we respond? Here's how we should respond. Very simple. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent of your sins. All of them. Whatever they are. Confess them to the Lord. If you are a brother and sister in Christ, you are not being a saint as God has called you to do if you have unconfessed sin that you are building up in your life. Get rid of it. Give it to the Lord. Abide in the vine and you'll do the rest. What if you don't know Christ? What should you do? Well, that's pretty simple. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Well, how do we do the will of the Father if I don't know Jesus? <laughs> Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But before you make any kind of decision like that, understand that Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. If you are boasting before you are surrendering, you are not ready to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, period. You have nothing to boast in. You have nothing to offer God or Jesus or the Spirit of God. Only offer your sacrifice of yourself. Surrender yourself and watch what the Lord, the Word of God and the Lord will do in your life. Amen? Amen? Amen. Because that is what it is. The Bible is clear on how we are to live our lives. Let's do it. Let's be obedient. Let's be people who say yes, Lord, every time the Word of God says something and the Holy Spirit says something as well. Let's be obedient. Stand with me, church. We're going to respond and, and, and response to the Word, and then after that, you're going to have an opportunity to, to come to the altar. You have an opportunity to come to somebody in this church. You can come to me. You can call me. Stay after it. Testing, whatever. But we need to understand that the Word of God speaks, and when it speaks, it expects an answer. That's all I have to say. Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I love you and I praise you. I thank you for these deacons that serve this church. I thank you for the men that serve in this church, the women that serve in this church. But Lord, you have called us to more. Your word says so. And so, Lord, I pray for the men that need to be elders, that need to strive and answer that call. I pray for the deacons that are not deacons yet, but they need to be. You've called them to be, and they're not answering the call. They're not praying about it. They're not being obedient to it. Father, I pray that they will do just that. Lord, let us never, not even just while I'm serving here, but period, never have men that are unqualified to serve that are serving as pastors, elders of this church. Let us never allow unqualified men that are serving as deacons to serve in this church. Why, Lord? Because you have taught us the damage. You've taught us the pain that that will cause. Lord, let us, when we have those men, let us have those wives that are striving for holiness and godliness as well. Lord, let us be a church that isn't like everybody, but let us be a church that when they read the Bible and they read us, they say, yep, they believe the Bible. Let us be a church that doesn't just believe the Bible, but preaches the Bible. Let us be a church that lives the Bible. Let us be a church that advances your kingdom, that makes disciples who make disciples who make disciples for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. I love you all.